Hi everybody, Mark Cleghorn here for the Photographer Academy and today we are talking about uh, boudoir and the 10 steps to getting up and going. If you haven't checked out the Academy boudoir films, then um, obviously uh, there is quite a, a, a comprehensive kind of series of imagery uh, and films for training as well as ideas and things really. So kind of head over to the Academy. Uh, this is uh, one of the uh, films that have just been launched on the Academy called Small Spaces. And uh, again, it will give you an idea on how to work in a very, very small space and how to get some great boudoir images with almost no Money being spent. So today, uh, in the second part of our series on the 10 steps to start a uh, boudoir photography business, uh, we're looking at lighting for boudoir. Now, uh, instead of just going through uh, a few shoots and a few images, you know, blah, 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 I thought I'd also go back in time for you. I want to show you all or some of the different kind of locations that I photographed boudoir in over the years, uh, including uh, officially when I was retired and all I was really shooting was boudoir then um, for um, a variety of different kind of uh, reasons for clients, for models, and obviously for online companies as well. Um, but today we're looking at the lighting for bud, uh, for boudoir. Predominantly, um, we're going to be talking about um, the use of window light and reflectors. Yeah, um, because I've always had a saying that is natural light before reflector, reflector before flash. Then we're um, understand a stand in as far as um, uh, the light is concerned, we can basically make the decisions on when window light is correct or when window light is not correct. So um, if you're a commercial photographer and you need to be photographing boudoir, you know, five shoots a day uh, and you're living in Wales where I am and basically it's winter, you know by around about two o'clock in the afternoon, uh, you're losing light, and if you're lucky, you've got light by around about 10 o'clock in the more morning, which is obviously going to give you very big restrictions. So I've included a few shoots where we're working in natural light and in winter uh, um, months as well, and in a room location to give you an idea of kind of um, how I cope with it and use the lighting at hand and so on. So uh, window light before, uh, uh, natural light before reflector, reflector before flash, flash as a last resort, that is the rule. So when we're using reflectors though with boudoir, as a rule of thumb, we don't want to overfill the subject. Um, that can actually be something that kind of flattens and fattens the body a bit too much. More often than not, um, studio flash uh, is going to be the thing that I'm going to um, opt for quicker. Um, why? Because it allows me to shoot any time of day as long as I want, as often as I want. I've got controllability and consistency of light at any time of day. And obviously I can change the sun as it were. Uh, so instead of working on a cloudy day or a sunny day or whatever it is, I've got that choice to be able to move from a soft box to hard, uh, to hard light whenever I decide it's right for that client. So um, as far as Studio 2 here is concerned, um, in, in, in my premises. Uh, basically, Studio 2 is technically changing rooms, it's called, but it really is my boudoir studio. So in, in these rooms you're seeing, or in this room, you're seeing a very, very big window light. Uh, we've got a bed that is set up the whole time. We've got some furniture that gives us a, a room kind of set, setting. But uh, basically what we've got is light, a lighting that can be controlled. So let's uh, just head across into uh, Bridge. Uh, and really what we're gonna end up with is talking about um, a variety in a shoot and what light is used. Before we get there though, okay, I thought we should kind of look at the different types of light, why, and then also, as I said, kind of taking us back in time and bringing us right up to date as well with it, things really. So um, as far as the... Um, church windows are concerned, these are very, very difficult because um, they've got uh, um, dappled colored light. And the biggest problem with that, of course, it's gonna throw colored light onto the body. It's not a big deal until I'm basically shooting in the direction of the client's face and I'm actually recording the colored light as a part of the main exposure. When I'm shooting in pro profile here, it really doesn't matter at all. But obviously um, in my bud boudoir uh, imagery, I do like space around the photographs as well and not just actually kind of fill in the frame. Uh, obviously, if you've got space, you use it. If you haven't got space, obviously you kind of have a different styling as well. 
So the natural light, when I'm shooting uh, here, um, obviously um, the light will go in and out as the kind of the uh, sun moves or the cloud comes in and out. Um, but the exposure is always from the body towards the light, uh, the light source. Very rare, uh, rarely is it taken for the shadow side of the body. But what I can do is add a big reflector panel in three, four, five feet away from the subject to bounce in some of the light. I believe this is one of the films that's going to go live very, very soon within the Academy as well, within things really. When I move into Studio One, um, that's what we're looking at here. They look very, very similar, in fact, Studio One and Two, because it's both in the church. Um, but as far as uh, this um, uh, window is concerned, instead of one big window, window it's split into three different panels so it's kind of having uh, three win three windows now i'm not talking about the three windows that are behind us that you can see here but basically to the sides of each of these three panels there's another strip win a window but it's kind of a, a big column between the two the benefit in that you obviously get like a a direction of the light source but then you also get a fill around from the other two sources um, so here we're looking at a sunny afternoon. Now in Studio One, I get full sunlight from around about one o'clock till about seven o'clock in summer months. And I get um, a, a sunny kind of window or a contrastier light between about midday and about three o'clock in a kind of a wintry month, kind of getting into all, all um, autumn up till Christmas, obviously less light or more light. The one thing to pay attention to is most of the time I'm using a light that is behind the subject or coming in from the dramatic side. So in other words, remember when I talk about the clock and compass, I talk about drama of the light coming in from the nine o'clock in a clockwise direction around to the three o'clock. As long as that light is coming in from that position, so in other words, as long as we follow that arc around, you are pretty much guaranteed of more drama in an image because you're creating more dramatic shadow. And hence, that's what we've got here. Now, not everybody can sit on heels, sucking in their tummy, leaning back onto a bed. I definitely know I can't do this, all right? Um, so it's it, you have to accept that not only is it different lighting and posing for the subject, but it's also a completely different kind of real animation to each of the different kind of clients that might be coming through your bud boudoir. So you've got to be sympathetic. But remember today, we are talking about lighting for boudoir. So here, the light is coming from the window. It's coming in from behind. It creates that drama. Now, this is quite a typical setup for me in, win in winter months. So we're seeing, in fact, uh, Studio One, uh, it's the windows that you just saw in the last image. Um, the three tall panels, as you can see, that we just saw in the background are technically now being hidden by a big softbox. In this case, it's a highlight. So it's designed originally as a background. And that's, in fact, how it's being used here, a big light source. I mentioned to you when we looked at the other photograph about these two side win windows and you can see the difference now in the column and you can see the, the one side window on the right hand side and there would be another one symmetrically on the left hand side as well. What we set up here though is basically a three sided studio um, for bud boudoir with a movable bed. So in other words this bed can actually be rota uh, rotated around with or without the client on it. Um, remember to tell your client you're going to move it, of course. But it also gives me just a little bit of space to actually add in more drama of light if that's what I want to do. So what we're looking at here is exactly the same qualities of light. It's just diffused compared to what we saw with the window light itself. So obviously the highlight itself is diffused. The light is bouncing inside the soft box. It then comes back out and then I'm giving texture to the light, i.e. Um, netting in front of it to make it look like a bit of a room set. So by doing that, of course, instantly I've got a 24 seven, um, 52 week of the year boudoir studio that I can use and I can kind of create kind of imagery. Now, if I want to use um, Studio One, so this is around about 
um, 20 feet away from where we just saw the other um, setup, but it's the same bed with the same highlight behind the same netting, just moved over out of the set. So here, this is more kind of where I would add in any bedroom furniture if we were doing any filming for Academy or if we were doing any work workshops to do with boudoir itself. Just gives a little bit more space when we're, wor we're working with um, up, up to 10 other photographers actually in a, a, a small studio environment. This is a big studio space so we can actually work quite e e easily and, and I know I've um, we've had quite a lot of e e emails through when we're starting our workshops up again uh, basically at present uh, we're not running anything till at least the summer of 2021 obviously with the circumstances of today and the COVID-19 so um, I know some photographers already running workshops but I've made the decision not to actually do it until uh, summer 2021. Okay, so what have we got here? We've got the move, uh, the movable bed. We've got the big high, uh, highlight running on the left-hand side. But now, in fact, in the top right-hand side, you uh, you can see we've got uh, another light, a light source. And this is a beauty dish with a big honeycomb grid on the front. So it, it's a big gridded light. So it creates more of a Hollywood style of spotlight kind of uh, control of the light. Obviously, we know that um, the... Um, uh, the gridded beauty dish uh, is basically going to give us a crisper direction. It doesn't allow the light to diffuse and basically kind of uh, um, feather in any way. So this is, if we look at this, this is creating a fill light from the left-hand side. This is the room light, as it were, coming in from the left. Whereas the um, main light source, in fact, as you can tell from the exposure on her, is from the actual gridded beauty dish itself. So it's a nice and easy kind of image. Now, when we tell the um, uh, window light not to fire, all of the light is coming in from the, be uh, the beauty dish. It's quite a big grid, obviously, as you can see, but as it's further away, of course, it will kind of create a bigger pool of gridded light. And that's really why it's so far away. Obviously, if I used a small gridded light um, to get the same effect, I might have to add in two or three different kind of grid lights within the scene itself. But you can see the difference already from a room set with am ambient illumination compared to really just switching off the ambient light and actually just using a, 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 just the... Um, the one flash. So when I talk about an ambient light, we should have the skill set with flash to illuminate the scene to an ambient level if we so wish. But then we should be also able to switch that lighting on and off. And that's what we've done here. So remember, we're going to be doing questions at the end, guys, if you uh, want to actually ask anything. So this is the ambient light gridded light shot okay so um again i don't really want the subject looking towards me this is kelsey our go-to kind of demonstration model she's great um and uh, we've seen a kind of real transformation of this woman uh, during the past three or four years um but she's really good because um she's got a great look a strength to her a nice um, shape of body but she is a real woman as well within things really so she kind of takes the animation she needs to be kind of uh, led into pose and so on which is obviously good especially in workshops so here we've got the drama of almost this kind of gridded light as you can see coming in from the one o'clock or the two o'clock position whereas we've got the am ambient light bringing some illumination to the back wall and through the net and to obviously some of the face itself when we uh, switch off the um, uh, window light now and we turn the bed around and we move the light source in the space, we can dramatically change the image. So if you look behind her, you're seeing the actual window light is now instead of running at the three o'clock position, sorry, the nine o'clock position, it is now at the 12 o'clock. But you can also tell it's been switched off. So it's told not to fire any illumination that it's giving you is just from the modeling bulb itself. Those of you who see me work in studio, those of me who've been on workshops with me know I work in a very bright studio as a rule. And then what I'm doing is killing the ambient light with obviously using the likes of strobe or flash and things really. So here on a white bed linen, just by you using a variety of uh, different fab fabrics, of course, we can change the dynamic fully, 
okay, as far as the color and the tonality and everything else is concerned. And you can see that where the light spills and touches something bright that is e equal to the skin, like the pillow in the background here, the biggest problem we've got all of a sudden, our eye is going off towards that vicinity, kind of looking at that now instead of her. And that is why we use the netting is to disguise a lot of the bed head and so on. At present, this is a perfect um, uh, way for us to go through a lot of bud boudoir clients. And all we've got to do is actually change the netting over between every single shoot <coughs> um, to allow for our kind of COVID protocols at present. Let's go back to the gridded light. So again, if we're looking for more of an exaggerated um, kind of the butt shot here and things really, obviously we're showing you the room set instead of actually the closer up of the finished image. But now we've got that dramatic image. So this is like sudden light. It's the only thing that's coming through. It's almost being reflected from a mirror. In this case, you can see it's just from the gridded softbox again, but we're creating a small light. Now, even that small light could be the likes of a, a very small LED, a small little torch, a small speed light, whatever it is, the key word is small so we can kind of control the light and its spill to create the, dra uh, the drama. As soon as I add a frontal light onto her, so from camera position or from the three to the nine o'clock in the, clock, uh, the clockwise, we start to lose uh, some of the drama itself because obviously we're starting to actually fill in all the shadow hero rears and this is where it kind of boils back down to you. When we want to actually use multiple lights to mold the bo uh, body to give shape, um, we usually use strip boxes and they'll usually come in again from the nine o'clock to the three o'clock position in a clockwise direction. That allows the different parts of the body to be lit um, as far as the kind of the shape and the direction to the light. So this would be coming in from the likes of the 10 o'clock position from the left hand side, as you can see, and then it would be coming in from the likes of the two o'clock or near the one o'clock position to give a bit of high, a highlight specifically down the stock in leg. So this would be the kind of image uh, or lighting I'd be using if I was shooting for lingerie and not just for boudoir itself. The soft boxes and the grids that I use, uh, uh, you'll know that I'm an Elincron man anyway by designing Studio Flash. So I usually use the likes of either a hooded Elincron soft box. So this is a strip box, but they, they had a, a, have an accessory that gives you almost like a hood. So it stops uh, a lot of the spread from the soft box itself, strip box, I should say. But uh, more often than not, not now, I'm using a gridded um, honeycomb softbox uh, and I've actually just moved over more to the Photics because they're great value to, uh, uh, for money. And of course, for a hundred, a hundred quid, you also get the uh, egg crate form of grid to go on the front of the softbox as well. So it's, it's phenomenal value for money. So the only difference in my studio you would see today, instead of just seeing a hooded um, strip box like you see in here, you would see something else that would look exactly the same, except they would have a honeycomb grid on the front, i.e. a egg crate. And that is what we use to really control that light to allow the spillage. Remember, a soft box is a soft light, whereas a hard light, even coming from a beauty, a beauty dish going through a grid, is referred to more of a specular or a harder light edge. Okay, so I wanted to go back in time for you, okay? So this is my um, room set um, when we were work, working just behind her and through the foliage would be the studio that we built in the ground to the house. And this would be our daylight studio where we were photographing quite a lot of boudoir here and things really. So all the kind of the room set once more, the cream sofas, the walls, the kind of the pictures that hang up, the, fo uh, the foliage and the netting was all designed about looking a bit like a, uh, a kind of a, a chic little hotel room kind of element to kind of add that little bit of kind of nostalgia and a little bit of variety into a client shooting uh, for commercial or for uh, kind of clientele was concerned. So here we've got the natural light coming through, no um, extra lighting coming through except for the room lights. So whenever I'm photographing in a room set, 
I've always got all the room light on. Any lamp that lights as a rule is switched on. Overhead lights would be my kind of separation lights and, and, and so on. So it just gives us that real kind of look and feel. And what I love about the day, uh, the daylight quality in such a big patio windows with multiple layers of diffusion of light, uh, it allows us to get this absolutely fantastic, huge, huge, big soft box full of light and things ready. So you can see here to the right hand side, that is exactly the same room, room set. We've just covered the uh, um, um, sofa in uh, netting or voile again. We've added some artwork into the background. We've moved from just layers of diffusion in the backlight. We've now added in uh, uh, the uh, Venetian blinds to cut out more of the light. And the reason we've done this is we're using more of the room lighting. So this is down lighters in the room rather than studio flash or anything else. So this is purely room light. The only bit of unnatural light within this image is coming in from the studio slope there, as you can just through uh, the archway. And that is a bit of flash that is being fired to give a three dimension so it doesn't go kind of dead. So it brings in that extra kind of element. Uh, and you and you can see in here when we're still using that same quality of light, no flash. This is just the overlight head lighting from the down lighters. Give, gives us a very simple small bud, boudoir. Now in today where we've got LEDs available, you could pretty much have two or three small little LED lights, diffused or not, on movable stands, and you'd be able to create such amazing imagery any time of day in the smallest of rooms. But the one thing I'd encourage you to do is have some amb ambient light so everything is not just in a, cod a contrast. Now, even though I've opted here for a warmer quality of the light lighting, um, what we that is just down to pure taste that's my kind of warmth and so on to do with this look now when we're looking at these images we're looking at close to 20 years ago so i just want to give you the idea of kind of longevity and stylization and kind of look and feel uh, to the kind of uh, element back into the studio again uh, again, we were photographing a lot of our brides to be. Um, so again, one sport. This is about 18 year, years ago. Um, I can't remember it's her, but I've just photographed one of her daughter, uh, somebody uh, who had a, one of our brides. Uh, one of their da daughters just had their uh, their 18th now. And she's got a very, very similar photograph, no nipple, of course, but a very, very similar photograph of a daughter, uh, kind of all those years on and things really. But it's, it's a different bride than what we're lo looking at here. But again, once more, I'd have to use a reflector here because we've got that light kind of coming through the window. It's light in the top part of the head. Technically, the face is not in light. So we'd need to add that little bit of day daylight in. One of the most common denominators in my boudoir and makeover photography in the past 30 years has been a shirt. Um, a shirt, whether it's white, uh, colored, um, variety, it doesn't matter. I, I really do like uh, um, uh, to use the prop as a shirt because it's a great way to start to unravel the body, especially with a client who's a little bit nervous, um, never even thought of doing this kind of shoot in the past. We can kind of gently break them into. Now, when we're looking at these kind of shoots, these would have been around about an hour and a half to two hours long, makeover kind of full on kind of session. Um, but again, as far as the, the, the boudoir of today, I could equally do the same thing. Uh, I don't live in this house anymore with a studio in the grounds, but uh, I could do equally the same thing in my studios that we've got here today. So again, thinking about the look and the feel. Then just going a little bit more kind of glamour. Uh, and this is uh, a model, Dion, that we photographed at the time and things really. Um, but again, uh, she she was one of the uh, models that we used for a DVD when DVDs were new from um, video, as it were. Um, but this was a, a part of a training kind of uh, session that we were doing, again, using the natural light, mixing it in with some daylight. Uh, you can see just through the archway, again, going down into studio. Um, but again, once more, all the nat natural light. What I'm trying to give you is encouragement to don't fear natural light just allow it to do its thing. So when we're looking at the likes of um, uh, dappled light coming through the windows, perhaps we've kind of pulled some of the um, uh, uh, 
uh, curtain back a little bit and things really, then you can basically start to see how it creases, uh, increases even more the dynamic of the light actually onto the subject's face and so on. And just in the, cor uh, the corner, bottom left-hand corner of this image, you can just see a reflector bouncing some light in. So uh, my wife Debbie would have been there with a reflector kind of bouncing in uh, uh, the light back and everything else with it and things really. But I'm not afraid when using natural room light to burn things out. One of the great things about uh, using a room set with natural light, things like sheer netting, allows you to kind of get a different type of photograph within seconds. So this is within minutes of each other here, where basically uh, uh, the sun has kind of gone away on this image, but in fact it was there when we were kind of doing the undressing element of uh, a lot of my boudoir at the time was going from a boudoir to nude kind of session. Obviously the clients get to actually choose the kind of look and feel that they want. But uh, again, just using the sheer net in to change the look and the feel. All right, so let's jump forward about 10 years. So this is just at the beginning, I think it is, or just before we launched Academy. Um, and we're in a, uh, a boudoir envi environment. Uh, we're in a hotel suite. Um, again, one of the things that we used to do as well um, was obviously uh, rent a kind of hotel space for the day or for a couple of days to be able to shoot four or five clients at, uh, at once. Uh, this is Becky, who used to be our, one of our models for a long time. Um, but really what I've chosen this is, it's actually so you can sit back and look at it. You can even go and watch these videos on the Photographer Academy so you can at least see how it was used. And this was really about posing and using the environment really. So big light is good, but there's two sides of a window, yes? There's gonna be a window where it's gonna give you direction to the light and you might have more harsh light lighting onto a subject. And then you're also gonna have a window that is gonna be in the shaded part of the light that will give you a little bit more subtlety of the light and so on. So just from here, um, the difference being here we're in a little bit more of the specular light, but in fact, in the first shot that we showed here, we're in a little bit more of the, the shade. Whereas when we move to the other window, just about, about 10 feet away, to do with the angle of the light, another angle of the sun coming through the window creates a little bit more energy. Obviously, it depends on uh, uh, the time of day and the time of year and everything else. Room lights, I mentioned to you, I want to be on all the time. And the reason for doing that is that I'm quite content for this to be um, the lighting. That is it. I don't need to actually overkill it. Um, our boudoir photography um, from its conception was called Confidential Boudoir. So I wanted to bring a little bit more of a... I suppose in, in the modern day world, a more of a 50 shades kind of element of boudoir. Um, there was a lot of photographers shooting nude. There was a lot of photographers photographing glamour, but I was trying to actually merge the two together in more of a kind of a, everybody deserves to be a model for a few hours, no, no matter what shape of body, no matter what age they are and so on. Uh, and obviously, like we discussed last week, you know, Today in the modern world, you're pretty much not going to make any money from models um, because obviously it's too available and so on. Um, but you're going to be photographing models to learn your craft or you're going to be photographing models so you can use them on likes of demonstration or portfolio work and so on. But the main money is going to be earned from a real client in a real location. When we start to kind of open up the drapes, now you can see all of a sudden is how even in the natural light room from closing the drapes on the last image to then opening up the drapes within minutes of each other can, can dr dramatically change the photograph. And that's the same as what we began with uh, seeing the studio set with the room ambient light and then using an accent light to actually create more dominance. So again, if you think of the window uh, which is now uncovered as obviously the ambient light within the room. And then we look at the um, uh, lamp, the room lamp being the accent light. That's exactly what we've created with hardly any work. Very, very similar here. Um, this is the flash ver version of the same film. So we made a natural light one. 
and we made a, uh, a flash one. Uh, by, uh, by the way, these images that you're seeing are directly out of camera. So it's the JFC and not from RAW, it's the JPEG from camera. So again, the wonky ang ang angles and everything else is just a lazy Cleghorn uh, old age arm. Um, but uh, again, um, as far as the kind of the finishing is concerned, there's nothing here. You are seeing the, the kind of the basically as shot photograph. But this is kind of the ambient light, which is big light. And then all of a sudden you add a honeycomb to the same light source and you can dramatically change it. Um, this is the wonderful thing that I really love about strobe is being able to go from a big light source to a small light source within minutes and completely dynamically changing the image to a whole different kind of look and feel. So we haven't kind of closed all the windows and everything else like you are before, you know, you saw before. This is the difference between a, a, a kind of a speed light photography and then a speed light with the likes of a honeycomb on to actually control all the lighting down. Same, same here, you can just see off to the right hand side, Claire, my assistant at the time, just holding the speed light, just actually with the honeycomb. Uh, and again, another one just actually in the left hand side to actually give some three dimensional illumination to the image. So lighting, as I mentioned in the beginning, the first thing is use the ambient light as much or as little as you want. However, if I'm in a room set, I really, really want to use as much of the ambient light in the room, including the the lamps as possible to bring the natural warmth and three dimension and separation within the scene. Okay, so come forward about 18 months then. Uh, this is a demonstration at a hotel at uh, one of the society's events and things really. And this is a model that we hired ourselves um, in our demonstration area live on the trade floor. Uh, and basically uh, the reason that we hire a model obviously is um, I try and make sure that uh, they're comfortable in front of a group of photographers. Um, whereas obviously taking along the likes of a real client or getting clients to come in and kind of pose in front of them can be a little bit more difficult. Um, however, when I train my experience group, there, besides for one model of the day, we'd probably be having in about four or five real clients coming through a shoot and being used as training guinea pigs um, for them. And obviously uh, uh, kind of that's the real way because I, I always think it's great to actually uh, kind of really show off what you can do with kind of a, a, a real woman, a normal woman. I'm not saying a model's not a real woman, uh, but what I'm saying is that, you know, somebody who's not used to being in front of the camera and needs a lot of direction and so on. So again, a winter's day, daylight is beginning to be soft. It's not really diffused glass, it's just dirt, it's dirty glass, which is worse. Um, and then if I wanna completely change the look, all I've gotta do is do the thing I love to do is breathe on the lens. <laughs> and uh, some of you will know that one of my um, true idols of kind of the beauty, the elegant, the uh, uh, innocence kind of thing is David Ham Hamilton. Uh, you see me even shoot in uh, that style uh, to kind of show off and as a celebration to somebody uh, that's the kind of photography that I absolutely love. Obviously, it's all down to taste and styling. Uh, but here, just by breathing onto the camera lens, as the lens starts to uh, defog itself, uh, basically, it'll start to obviously clear. So in the good old days, we could have put a filter in front of it. We could have sprayed varnish on uh, for head lacquer onto a filter remember to do that before you physically put it onto the camera lens uh, the good old tricks were using stocking in front of the lens different shears for different effects burning a cigarette hole into the shear as well to have a clear to the soft focus then we would actually have a filter that would screw on the front of the lens uh, we used to use in the Hass Hasselblad days and then basically spray as I said a uh, air lacquer. We used to actually do like a two pence piece in the middle of the filter, give one spray of lacquer, let that dry, get rid of the two, the, the, the two pence piece, then add a five pence piece in, in the middle, then do another spray of lacquer and you have this lovely vignette uh, of, of uh, a kind of soft softness going out and things really. But again, it's just down to taste. So window light is good. Do not be afraid of window light. Do not be afraid of any lighting God throws at us or the location that you find yourself in. 
it's up to ourselves to actually realize how do I use this light to shape and mold the body. Um, as a rule, we'd usually be turning the body away from the light source, okay? Because we are looking to create a more voluptuous uh, bust or a controlled shadow on a very big bust, all right? So by turning the body away from the light source as a rule, the lighting will create the shadow, the shadow will create the shape. We win with that. There are times like this, though, where we've got a uh, subject turned into the light, uh, the light source. But however, if we look at the cleavage and we look at the shadow coming down the arm and just through the tattoo area, we can see there is a three dimensional shape in the shadow there. So it depends on the time of day. Once more, same image, same location, breath on the lens will dramatically change that no matter what. Now we kind of really bring it up to, you know, just a, a couple of year, years ago and uh, looking at more the kind of the harder light. So either a gridded light or honeycomb lights or basically uh, um, a barn doors light, light, lighting to create more dramatic uh, images. I would definitely go and watch this series of films that we did on the Academy a couple of years ago, because there's some really, really great training, and especially the shoot of Charlotte. Charlotte had never done boudoir before. She's a dancer model that we've used time and time again um, for workshops, um, but she'd never done bud boudoir. And so it was basically uh, kind of a first for her. And uh, again, it's weird when you've been photographing for somebody for so long, and then all of a sudden she's nervous in front of you because she's out of her genre. Um, but again, look at the uh, uh, gridded lights or the barn door lighting, how we're not allowing it to spill around the set. We're looking at it for just to separate the client. So going back to the beginning, like we were saying about the clock and compass with the direction of the light source, we've got a light coming in from the 10 to the 11 o'clock position, which is definitely a barn doors. And then we've got another light coming in from the two o'clock, one o'clock position, which would be the lights of another honeycomb or a barn door lighting as well, just to kind of control the light, lighting. This is where the ability to switch lighting flash, I'm on about, on and off, is great because when I switch from kind of all, that would mean both lights fire or to one group or another group, I'm telling the different lights to fire at different times. So here I'm now using the barn doors light, which is at the uh, was at the two or the one o'clock position. As you can see, it's quite high. Um, but now that's the only light that is firing in the set. And that kind of gives us the overall illumination on face and arm and leg right down to the edge of the foot. But you can almost see the barn doors being used, how it is basically shielding the, uh, the foot and the bottom of the bed. So it just doesn't kind of create it exactly the same light source, exactly the same position. Just all I've done is move the subject from where we are here from my six o'clock. I'm going to move the camera position to where is her nine o'clock position as we see it now. Okay. And then I'm going to shoot towards that light light source. And then we're moving the subject to the different kind of uh, position. Now, here I'm using the light coming in from the because I've moved my camera position, a light that was at the one o'clock to two o'clock, because I've now changed my position to a new six o'clock position, that light is coming in from the uh, 11 o'clock to the 10 o'clock position, okay? Now, the reason I've kind of allow, allowed it to light the hip and the face of the same luminosity is because it's boudoir. With a woman with a fuller figure, um, I would basically shield a little bit more of the tummy and the thigh, and I would obviously have to do a little bit of liquefy on the tummy by design, um, just because most clients want themselves to be better than they are in real life. But I would put that room light on and off, uh, depends. Now, there's times where you stick a room light on uh, and you, you can just see this light here, this little lamp. And the reason it switched off, because it looked like it was basically sticking out of a butt. And we obviously don't want to actually just go from there. Exactly the same light. All I've done now is back. She's back on the bed. I'm shooting in the same way, but we've got that lovely position. Now we've turned her against the light. So in other words, we've moved, completely changed the setup now. Now we're using a light at the 10 or 11 o'clock, which has got no reflector dish on it at all. It's completely bare, bare bulb. It's scattering fully. 
And at this stage, I could opt for either a reflector to my right hand side at the four o'clock position, or in my case, I'm using a barn doors lighting like we saw right at the beginning. So you, you can see here in the set, setup how simple and how dramatic that room is. Now, pretty much if you've uh, seen a lot of the boudoir shoots that I do, you know that the room takes on so many different kind of disguises in the course of their, their hour plus to get the different kind of looks and feels. But by the time we finish, we reset every back to a, nor a normal, uh, ready for another shoot and things really. So here we've got in the top left-hand side, this is this 10, 11 o'clock light. This is the bare, the bare bulb, just allowed to scatter, lights the wall, lights the bed frame, lights the body, lights the bed. And then we've got the um, barn doors light uh, just kind of spilling onto the subject space. So if I now uh, reposition myself, so in this, what I'm doing is I've put my back against the wall that was seen in this photograph, and I'm, shoot, I'm shooting technically directly towards where she is, except she's being moved towards the, win uh, the window. Now, because I've got these beautiful stained glass windows uh, within my um, studio, I want to use them not only for illumination, but I also want to use them for the silhouette. I absolutely love these kind of images, and I play quite a lot uh, around with getting the position or the body or the body part within the right position to actually really great some great silhouette images and things. Really, it's one of the things that it, it's there, so why not you use it? And you know, hundreds of photographers have photographed in my studio. And I very rarely see anybody using this kind of effect for the kind of the silhouette and things really. And she's only about two to three feet away from the background. Look at the difference now when you expose for the shadow area within the photograph. You burn out the, wind, the window light. You kind of start to actually burn it, the whole image, including the skin. But two very different images within seconds of each other just by changing the exposure okay and that is the window in its whole entirety so looking at the window light looking at the uh, strong light that can come through um, we can turn the bed against the light diffuse that window light to uh, lose the wind at uh, the windows overexpose just a little bit to get a little bit of detail in the shadow area to start to actually soften and break up the image. So for instance, here I'm photographing theoretically from um, the, the hand nearest to me towards the flash or towards the window uh, to actually get my working exposure. There's enough spill around the scene to actually uh, give some illumination towards the body. Notice when we turn the subject towards the window light, the light goes from very specular and soft to a lot more kind of sharper and contrastier. That's natural because, of course, one, you're working against the light, one, you're working with it. No, uh, no difference. When I work on location and I'm shooting um, anything as a rule, um, I'm always facing the sun. So I'll always, as a rule, try and get the subjects back towards the light source rather than in towards the sunlight unless I'm looking for a very, very dramatic type of light of lighting for sun or something to actually create the three dimensional kind of darkness. So again, don't don't be afraid of shooting with the light. You'll tend to find, though, with the harder light light source, you will need to do a little bit of soft softness or extra softness to your images uh, no matter what. So thinking about the scene and how you can use that one set to get the variety is really what we're trying to do. So all I've done here is pull the uh, netting back um, by moving the, the one stand. I've technically moved the bed out of position. I've revealed the, uh, the kind of the studio cupboard, which acts as a wall. I'm now using against the light to get the drama once more in exactly the same way as we began to actually look at today's session. So remember, really what we've looked at is a bed in a position. In this case, I'm using the windowsill, but it doesn't have to be in the windowsill uh, to create a daylight any time of day. So um, if we then kind of uh, just step backwards and we go here, 
when we look at uh, Kelsey in this shoot from beginning to end, okay, we go from using the, uh, the studio highlight as a daylight window. Obviously, this is all flash. We're shooting against the light now to actually get the more drama coming through. We're using against the light again with the light to actually spill over to the top. So again, the light could be up a little bit higher, but we're using a reflector panel at the front here to bounce the light backwards. We're using that harsh sunlight coming from behind just to create the three-dimensional deep dark shadow. We're using that same position, that same location, just changing the camera position, but now taking the exposure for the highlight part of the skin to make sure we don't burn out. Here we're using a separation light coming in from the 10 to the 11 o'clock position. And then we're using the likes of a snoot or a mini snoot on, onto the face to actually just bring the face alive. We're using the likes of a ring flash to give more of a fashiony glamour kind of boudoir. Back to the window light again, but just uncovering the window more. We're using that gridded light um, from the uh, 10 o'clock position like we began to show off the first thing. And there we're adding in the, uh, with or without the actual um, extra wind, uh, window light to bring either more or less detail into the session itself. But for me, what you're seeing is the preferred. It's the darker, moodier image rather than the, uh, the big or day, uh, daylight. So technically, most of this is one small light, light source or two gridded light sources. The window light for me, it kind of gives me that room set, that kind of realization in the same way as a, a bedroom set, a kind of a quilt or sheets gives us that kind of image. Once more, I'm not afraid to turn the body away from the light and allow to actually blow out some of the, high, the highlights running through out the whole image itself. But again, I really want to bring some drama into the image. So I'm using a crisper light source and I'm not afraid of that. But again, as far as silhouettes and kind of edgier images and use of the day at the daylight, think of your your setting. Um, how am I going to basically use what I have to the best of my ability? That's that's the main thing I need you to ask yourself. Is kind of based on what you have, without buying any kit, how do I change the look and the feel to the photographs? Okay, so we've got some questions coming through. Hope you've enjoyed that first kind of looking at the lighting uh, for boudoir. And we'll hope to kind of follow this through. And remember, we're live at five on Wednesdays. And during the course of the year, I'm sure we'll be doing some boudoir shoots uh, as well and things really. All right, so um, hello from Spain. Hello, <laughs> hello, Grant. Um, looking at netting, where, uh, where do you find, find, find it? Uh, the first thing I would do is go down to the local um, material, uh, material shops and just buy it by the meter. I mean, meters and meters and meters of it. And if you're stuck and you can't find anything, uh, the likes of Ikea, in fact, just to the side of me here, I'm showing you actually in here, these are just the uh, netting that we kind of uh, get from Ikea. And it's great to actually just put on a little bit of a, a wire or a studio stand anyway. Um, as far as materials are concerned, uh, we either store them on a roll, so they're rolled up, um, or they're folded. And then if they're folded, basically most of the time I'm creasing everything. So where I'm using a solid material, a material usually it's going to have a complementary net over the top of it, um, which will disguise any of the kind of the creases that we might have within the photograph. Pretty much all the netting is rolled up into different bags and we'll just pull out uh, pastel or darks, whites, blacks. So we go straight to the bag and kind of pull that out ready. In protocol today, once it's been used in a shoot, if I've got another shoot to follow, obviously we do have to have a change over a set and a clean down to do with our studio protocol anyway and things really. So it's only used once before it's then cleaned. Um, as far as uh, uh, how much to buy and when, um, I would say fill a bag with white. When I say a bag, you know, something that would take a, a background about kind of a, a foot and a half circumference and about two, about two feet deep, uh, just stuff it in there with as cheap a netting voil as you can get. Um, and then uh, look around for what's on offer. 
Uh, the silks and things that we used to use, I probably use them less now than I used to. Uh, I use silks, in fact, we just saw an image. Um, I don't know where it was. There, okay. So as far as I call this the bath time image, <laughs> Um, but basically, it, it's there to actually kind of uh, do a, a an un, a unpeeling of the body. So, in other words, we're kind of unraveling the body, and it's an easy way to flow for a client who needs to kind of move from the boudoir to the nude and so on. Um, but again, these kind of drapes often are just cheap because you can see the creases on them; they're absolutely terrible. But just by going in and adding some kind of uh, Gaussian blur usually fixes most of the problem anyway with it. Um, but uh, again. And if uh, you're doing this kind of thing, perhaps an iron, or if you keep it on a roll, uh, like, like they do in the shops, that, that will obviously minimize the actual crease in any way. How many shots do I do on a boudoir shoot? Um, again, uh, it, it's more to do with the time, variety of lingerie that the client has kind of brought in. And I usually break a shoot up into three parts. So I would do the likes of the uh, window light kind of setup. Then I'd use the drama setup. And then it depends on the client whether they're moving from boudoir to nude because they will have a slightly different kind of animation. But as a rule of thumb, I'll take uh, during the hour probably about 400 images, uh, probably edit it down then to 10% of that. So about four, uh, 40 to 50, uh, to 50 images. Uh, a bit of a tip when you're um, editing a uh, boudoir, start in reverse. Uh, I did keep the JFCs there, didn't I? Okay. So uh, this is uh, one of the uh, Kelsey shoots that we did as a for a DVD, I think it was, many years ago. Um, but basically, if this was a real shoot, I wouldn't start at the beginning. I would actually go to the end of the shoot. In this case, all I would do is basically is uh, flip um, from the, the last to the first, as, as it were. In, in this case, let's go to the end of the shoot before we went into the posing guide. Okay, so there's the posing guide. So I would start here, and when I was going to edit, I'd now work backwards. Okay, obviously for you, it would be one client uh, and then basically you just actually flick them in bridge to do the ascending, uh, et cetera. Um, but as, as a, a rule, make sure that you usually the best images are going to be the last ones you take. So in that case, you know, if you look at these photographs that would be here, you would gather that these last two or three images will probably be your best photographs. So th that's what I'm saying. If I work in reverse, so if I just kind of look at this image first, and I would go backwards now. Yes, that is better. So is that one. And that one, you can see the difference, just a little bit of the animation of the body. I like a little expression here. I like the expression there. Bit hard here. So I've chosen correctly to begin with. Do you know what I mean? So straight away by working that in and reverse, um, you've been able to actually uh, quickly edit through and through. You could almost kind of get away with ditching, you know, um, the first kind of half of any part of the setup, but you never know there are times. But just going through the flow. So you're looking at 890 images here, but that's probably because we were doing the DVD. There'd be a, a fraction less of images here. Probably things like when you're doing the butt shot, when you're doing kind of the close-up of body parts, um, like bums or tummies or boobs or arms or hands or uh, whatever the client is suggest uh, suggesting, you're probably going to just uh, really kind of manipulate the body into a different position to kind of really show off the, uh, uh, the position of the body to its best effect. Uh, oh, any tips on ironing and Stalkbridge? I just did that anyway. <laughs> Uh, what size of netting do you find most useful? Um, it, it comes in a role, and I, to be fair, uh, it's a good quest, question, and I don't know what the answer is, because it's in a roll. It's probably about two meters or a meter and a half long. Um, it's usually halved. So on the roll, if you imagine the fab fabric is folded first before it's rolled on, so you'd be probably looking at a two meter 
um, fabric, I would think, that you'd be buying it as. So that's the kind of uh, thing we're going for. But remember, as I said, just go and buy some cheap, like, um, netting from the likes of Ikea. In fact, the image that you're seeing here in this small studio boudoir is all technically Ikea. It's Ikea netting as the small stu studio. And then it's basically, uh, we mentioned this before we got going today, um, but if I just switch off the sound for a minute, there you go. So if we look at the imagery, oh, um, technically that is two lights. We're looking at a, a beauty dish, which is at the 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock position to me, that is illuminating the wall. And then you've basically got a, a one or two o'clock strip, a strip box, um, which is being either told to fire or not fire. Most of the time in this film, you're gonna find that there's one light going off. So you can see here, um, in the same way, we've got a, a light kind of um, a window light in, in the background, um, but it might not, I can't remember the film whether we were using it for fill or not with it and things. But when you look at that simple setup there, there's absolutely no excuse for you guys um, or girls, obviously, sorry, um, to not kind of uh, get going in the likes of boudoir portraiture. Um, obviously, the main thing, as I said in the first session, was if you're new to boudoir, I would definitely hire a model for the day. Set your parameters, set your ideas, set what your shoot list is going to be, make sure you've got the flow. And then basically um, shoot as many different kind of types of uh, um, pose animation so you can then learn you can also kind of get your different kind of setups for studio studio in the way that you want them to actually behave and things really but uh, the good news about boudoir could, tends to be a little bit more dramatic tends to be a lot more kind of close-up imagery you can work in very small spaces um, are you supplementary in the natural window light in the big light box with a flash mix? So when we go back to the um, photographs uh, here, 10 steps to boudoir, is there an image? So let me go back lighting for boudoir. So this image is all this big window light, okay? Hardly any of the ambient light is gonna mix into the exposure in any way, as you can see how dark it is as, as being shot. Uh, when the uh, window light is being used later on, so like here, um, I'm not adding any flash in addition to the uh, window light itself. No, this is pure daylight lighting coming through. When we go back to the shot that we saw of Char Charlotte, you can see here that basically this is all flash, whereas this image, the silhouette, is no flash and basically just the exposure for the windows, whereas this image is the exposure for the shadow side of the, uh, of the face. That's why we get those two extreme images. <clears throat> uh, good question. What is uh, the daily rate for a boudoir model? Um, well, funny enough, uh, men and women are pretty much about the same price. In fact, you should expect to spend anywhere from about 125 to about 200, uh, 200 pounds. The higher the fee, the more experienced the model, without a doubt. And uh, again, as far as if somebody is really just getting going, um, uh, they they will basically be a little bit more harder work for you if you you're just learning your craft as well. Sorry, uh, if you're just learning your craft as well. Um, but I'd usually say that go after dancers and actors uh, as well as a bit of a shout a shout out because at times they can almost be better as a learn learning curve than just going for a. Uh, a boudoir model, a lingerie model and things really. Uh, a lingerie model will basically help you in some animation if they're experienced, but if they're not experienced, I would definitely work from a shoot sheet and basically choose the likes of um, uh, a dancer and so on with it. But they're, you know, they're readily available on model sites like Purple Port. Excuse me. Purple Port for uh, professional models, especially for boudoir. I personally would try and avoid more of a glamorous model because I'm really trying to teach and train for the ev everyday woman. Um, so I'd much prefer somebody which has more natural look. That's what I loved about Malia when we first booked her 
even though her look of age is quite young, uh, she is. She takes direction brilliantly. I definitely book her again and again and again. She's really that good. Very natural. Uh, and because we were going live at five with the Academy, we had to do a little bit of rehearsal. We decided um, because of YouTube restrictions that we weren't going to be doing boudoir um, with her on the first shoot that we did, that we needed to actually make sure that we didn't get into trouble about uncovering and so on and so on. So we, we, we're just, um, we, we pre-recorded, as you saw, they've already been released on us, or some of them have been replaced, uh, uh, released on Academy already and things. So, uh, yeah, so anything from about that. Uh, what was the wall of flowers? Sorry, I've jumped a few que questions here. That's just, uh, we bought those. Uh, they're sold in kind of um, square panels and we stitch them together with just zip ties. You can buy uh, buy them on floristry, um, florist uh, suppliers and everything else with it and things really. Uh, they're not very expensive, but to create a wall, probably you're looking at a couple of hundred quid tops for a big wall kind of, uh, uh, but again, it depends on budget, but they do add in. I, each year I give myself a bit of budget to actually spend on studio, on studio props. And then I look like, okay, what can I buy <laughs> to get the most use out of them and things with it? And, and it's a bit of fun just actually looking at um, what, what we could actually buy in, even going down to local junk shops or charity shops or whatever it'll be. I mean, our clothes rail in Studio One it's probably over the years I've spent no more than 500 quid on and it's bursting uh, and a lot of it comes from the likes of charity shops and things really uh, and uh, again oh that will do you know that will fit this type of client and so on and so on but it also allows us to have a little bit of variety but as far as la laundry is concerned all of our clients all of our models have to bring their own uh, the only thing that we have is uh, slips so uh, basically uh, just covering the boobs that if the client has not brought in the right thing, we have fresh uh, colored slips that they can actually wear um, either on top of a bra. Because if you've got somebody um, with a part of uh, kind of a baby belly or, or the likes of, or somebody's a little bit fuller or they've had dramatic weight loss often, um, they might not have the right lawn, uh, laundry with them. So I need something that is actually going to just uh, help me to help them as well with it. Uh, so uh, why do you use a harsh light? It's just because I like it. <laughs> All right, so sorry about that. There's no other option that I like shadow. Um, and I think it brings more of Hollywood kind of look and feel, uh, just me. Uh, do you prefer black and white or color in boudoir? I prefer black and white, uh, but we sell both. Um, do you prefer to work with a younger model or an older model? Uh, it really depends on what I'm trying to actually look at. Um, so if I'm looking predominantly to build a, a promotion based on brides to be, I've got to have a model bride that would, you know, somebody who would fit into that genre of brides that I would work with. Um, I would definitely encourage you to shoot with um, real kind of clients as well at some stage as soon as soon as you can. Um, but don't tell them you're inexperienced. Uh, just tell them you're trying out some new ideas, but have your shoot flow and everything else with it and things really. And I hope by the end of this 10 steps, it's going to give you a confidence to really kind of get going. If you are interested in uh, a boudoir workshop here, we usually do them over two days, to be honest. Um, let us know in the question panel uh, that you'd be, in, uh, be interested in things really. Um, and uh, again, I can pass that over to the uh, the girls. You can still go to the markclemon.com site and drop an, e an email to us anyway. Uh, we have no booking capabilities because we haven't launched anything for 2021 at all yet. Um, what's the problems with a fuller figure? It, it, do you know what? Funny enough, it's just what I said. It's probably uh, a little bit more on the, uh, the kind of the belly size, uh, a little bit more shaping on the hip. Obviously, animation of the body is it. But as far as most things are concerned, I'm not worried about a fuller figure because I can use netting and drapes um, even if they've come in with completely the wrong um, uh, la laundry to wear, I can pretty much get away with uh, using the drapes and the sheets to actually hide and body sculpt from there. I'm not just relying on liquefy tool and everything else with it. Last question then come in. Uh, would you use a model resembling the target or, oh, well, I mean, basically body shape? Yes, I would, definitely. But I think it's better if you can um, really use 
somebody, not only it's the right um, age group, but it would also be the different figure sizes that you're going to have. Um, why? Because you need to learn how to uh, body sculpt and body shape and light each of the different kind of body shapes. And, and I wouldn't stick to one because one day you're going to go, what the hell do I do here? And that can work with a very, very, very slim model as it can work with a very, very full size model a client. I mean, you know, um, it, it's kind of you've just got to really practice with both things. That's us, guys. I hope you've enjoyed the 10 steps to start, start starting a boudoir photography business. Uh, let, please uh, head over to the Facebook page if possible for us. Um, why? Because it's always great to get your feedback no matter what. And it's obviously great to um, uh, hear what you think about these webinars. Uh, remember, remember that you can share to your page any of our um, uh, boudoir or kind of videos just by selecting the film and kind of clicking onto the share this page, whether it's through your Twitter account or your Facebook account and so on with it. We're trying as well, uh, as you can see, to kind of uh, bring the um, uh, the films into a series for you. We like to do that on Academy, um, just so you've basically uh, got something else to go and look at. So, you know, where you've got the small studio spaces, boudoir, you might want to then actually go and look at the, the boudoir to nude, because you're used to the model now and you're used to actually what we're going to be doing and so on. And then you want to go, oh, okay, so let's go backwards in time. So what's this 24 shots bud boudoir posing guide part one? Then you definitely, I mean, that is so old. That is 12 years old and it's still as current, I bet, as anything, except it would be in low resolution. Uh, but anyway, that's enough from me today. I hope you've enjoyed uh, second part of 10 steps to starting a boudoir photography business. Get over to Facebook, say how much you love us. If you don't, uh, oh, oh, don't go to face, Facebook and don't tell us that you love us. See you all soon anyway. Take care. Bye-bye.